r slash no sleep posted by you slash unseen visitor the gangly man part one when Catherine was born my life began coming in at an even eight pounds with a little curl of blonde on her forehead my sweet sweet angel had ignited something in me the moment my eyes caught sight of her she was perfect beautiful and pure i swore as i held her in my arms someone or something from above told me that this was my moment to turn my life around i had a drug addiction mainly cocaine but I wasn't shy from an assortment of other substances, yet that day I promised both her and myself that I would never touch a single drug again. And I had kept that promise. Catherine's mother, however, couldn't say the same. She couldn't wait to get back out to the closest crack den she could find and shoot up. After a tough fight with CPS, proving to some hard-ass judge that this girl was everything I needed in my life, I won sole custody of her. I was elated. Our life wouldn't be perfect, but I would make it everything I could for her. When Catherine passed away, I swore I would never recover. Holding her hand in mine as I felt her fade from this place to the next had to be the hardest thing I have ever had to do, let alone do it by myself. It's one thing to lose someone you love unexpectedly, but it's another thing entirely to lose your only child without warning. Hell, even if I knew what was about to happen, it would not have taken any of the edge off. She was sleeping at her friend Sabrina's house. It was late, like 11.30 at night. I was asleep when my cell started going off. I always had it on and turned it to max volume when she was out for the night because she had a bad case of night terrors and often didn't last the whole night at her friend's house. I was so thankful she had a good group of friends though, none of them poked fun at her or bullied her for it, they were all more than understanding of my baby girl's problems. When I answered the phone, I was already prepared for the conversation I would have with her. Hey sweetie, did it happen again? The answer wasn't what I expected, nor did it come from Catherine. Hey, Mike? It's Rayanne, Sabrina's mom. You need to get here, now. I tried to ask Rayanne what had happened, why she sounded so panicked over whatever it was, but she hung up on me before I could even finish a breath. I got in my car and I drove through the heavy rain, passing by dim street lamp after dim street lamp until I made it to the house. I nearly destroyed my brakes from how hard I slammed on them when I noticed the two cop cars and ambulance, all their lights coloring the abyss of the night on the street. I hopped out of the car and ran up to the door where two of the officers were standing. One turned to me, their hand held out to stop my approach. My daughter's in there, what's going on? I stammered through the heavy downpour. At this, the second officer also turned to me. Sir, are you the father of Catherine Sutton? This all seemed so weird, like a feverish dream. Yes, why? What's wrong with my daughter? The next two hours are a barely lucid play-by-play -play of events where my body and soul had become too detached from each other. I sat there, on Rayanne's couch, her on one side of me holding Sabrina, and in my hands I held her favorite teddy bear, a simple brown bear I had bought her as an infant from some convenience store when picking up diapers. She had taken it everywhere with her. It was so worn down and torn and coming undone at the seams, I saw my reflection in that bear. The police asked the standard questions. What Catherine looked like. How old was she, general weight and height? Had she ever run off before? I can't remember answering a single question, but I remember them writing in their notepad so I must have given them something of a response enough times before they asked me to come with them to the police station as they put together a search team to look around the general area. As we rode underneath the streetlights, I clenched that bear in my hands so tight, and though the abyss out of my window began to creep into the back of my mind, I held firmly to the knowledge that very soon I would find my baby girl, she would be safe and we would get through whatever happened. Together. I hadn't once let any of that darkness creep to the forefront of my mind. The police put their team together and we looked through every alley, back road and gutter we could think of and found nothing. The plan was when the sun began to rise we would meet at the woods just outside of town and comb them. She had to be somewhere. Finally, we met at the clearing just before the trees. It was me and eight other officers, four of whom hadn't been at Ray Ann's. I can't explain it. But there was something about when I entered the forest that just told me I was about to see my Catherine again. And after 20 minutes of looking around, I was right. Yet I wish even to this day that I was wrong. I don't know how or when, but at some point I had lost the trail of the police and had found myself on my own in silence, albeit the rain pouring hard on the foliage around me, with nothing to guide me forward except for the slow rising sun. The bush had gotten thicker and heavier. More thorns scraped at my legs and arms as I pushed on until I had finally come to another clearing. I was not alone anymore. In front of me were three things, all of which I took in at once and yet somehow could not piece together, even now as I think back on it. 
there was a broken tree stump, splintered and jagged in the very center of this clearing, the rest of the tree was only feet from it, it looked as if some force had snapped the tree from its base. Standing behind the stump was a figure that, thanks to the small amount of sunlight, I could tell was inhumanly tall. It was very bony, naked and lanky. Its neck alone seemed to be two feet long. Its fingers, things that looked like broken needles, were holding onto the thing in front of it, the thing impaled by the tree base. It was completely hairless yet it looked so inhumanly human. When you were young, did your parents ever read you the story about the crooked man who lived in the crooked house? If so, that's what this thing looked like to me, but on a much more grotesque level. The thing it was devouring, I looked down on it finally and my mind tried so hard to lie to me about what I was looking at, but nothing could stop me from accepting what I had seen. My Catherine. The thing had her nearly torn to pieces and yet she was looking right at me, her mouth shaking as she tried to say something, anything to me. As I noticed her, the thing had noticed me. It looked up from her towards me, its face a grotesque smile from ear to ear. Its eyes were white with bloody veins streaking through. It stood up so fast, that it seemed to just appear standing out of nowhere. Without warning or notion or even reason, it turned and began to run through the trees, its hands held up to the sky like a child running from a playful pursuer. I didn't know what to do, what to think. What had I just witnessed? What insanity was that? I threw those thoughts aside and I ran to Catherine, falling to my knees before I cradled her head and stroked the hair from her face. She looked up at me with pure shock and terror in her eyes and I held back my tears as I told her it's okay. I told her to go to sleep. I told her I loved her. I told her I loved her so fucking much. I said I was sorry, I couldn't protect her like I had promised her I would. I kissed her forehead again and again and I fucking gained praying to God above that I would wake up and it would be sunny and I would drive to pick her up and this fucking nightmare would fade into my memory. That moment wouldn't come. I don't know when she faded, I just know she was gone by the time the police had found us. I didn't tell them what I saw, how could I and why should I? They wouldn't believe me that some 8 foot tall gangly man of a monster fucking ate her. So I let them come up with their own assumptions. They said the kidnapper must have killed her and dropped her off in the woods, and some animal must have gotten to her. They would never find her killer, at least for their sake I hope they never do. I see it all the time now. Every time I drive by those woods on the outskirts, I see it poking its elongated face out of the tree line and just smiling at me. And it knows that I see it. And that makes it happy. The Gangly Man. Part 2. I'm back in the forest. It's just dawn. The trees are blocking most of light, yet there's enough for me to see just barely in front of me. The trees feel closer than my first time here. Yet, somehow, I, I feel as if this is exactly where I was when I lost her. My little girl. I hear that sound again. That grotesque, pungent sound of it tearing into her stomach. I can hear the slight, moaning, coming from it as it devours flesh and bone. And then the images fly into my mind. It looks up at me from its meal. Its white eyes, the red veins throughout. Its ear to ear smile, bearing needle like teeth behind meat and blood. Its hairless, humanoid features, stretched and skewed like it was literally just skin and bone. I see it stand up so quickly, void of hair and any form of clothes on its 10 foot tall body. Its arms reach its knees, its hands almost to its ankles. At full stretch, it looks as if it has to bend to avoid most of the branches on the trees around it. And then it turns and runs away looking like an excited child playing a game of tag. And then I see Catherine. Splayed out on a broken tree stump, my little girl breathing her last raspy breaths as blood and vomit spews from her mouth. She looks at me as I run to her with panic, fear, pain and grief across her face. I hold her, I scream. I kissed her. I apologize that I let this happen. She fades away. And then I see it again. Staring at me with eyes that have no pupils, yet it stares directly at me directly into me. And it tells me all that I need to know. It tells me it owns me with that stare. It tells me no matter what I do, it will win. It tells me this is a game. And it runs away. And I wake up. I've had this nightmare every single night since the incident. I can't get the scene to stop playing over and over in my head. I have literally been stuck in that fucking clearing since the police had found me and Catherine there. What makes it worse is that everyone knows she's dead. They all look at me with such pity and remorse. It's the guy whose kid died, says one. I heard she was eaten by a wolf. Responds another. He's a drug addict, wouldn't be surprised if the prick did it himself. Says the few. I respond to no one. How, why would I? Who would believe me that an overly tall and lanky, 
stretched out humanoid thing had eaten my fucking daughter and ran away from the scene Ingly. Who would believe me that I stared that thing in its empty fucking eyes, and saw its happiness with what it had done. That would just confirm their suspicions. So I don't respond. I let them all think what they want to about it all. They weren't there. Them knowing the truth wouldn't bring my baby girl back to me. So I go on living, day by day. I eat, I sleep. Most importantly however, I research. I haven't found a name for the thing, not one by lore standards at least. However, I have found some deep web postings about sightings of a creature that matches the description of this thing. I felt as though I was at a loss, until I found one posting on a website that has since been lost to me. I copied it, and now I plan to try it. How to scare the gangly man by user 56A12KL9 The gangly man, a creature often found in the wooded areas in, redacted, is a creature of unknown origin. Although it looks to be a human, its features seem to say otherwise. It appears to be more of an evolutionary kin to us, like that of primates but more monstrous and predatory. This creature tends to prey on smaller creatures than it, preferring squirrels and birds over large dogs or bears. Sometimes, the creature will find itself in a town or city, looking for a more satisfying meal. This tends to be children. From my findings, at least 40 cases in the past two years of missing children can be attributed to the gangly man. All of them are found in close to the same fashion. Their bodies are torn apart, mutilated and ripped asunder. Their faces are locked in a state of fear and pain. One person, Richard, redacted, from the town of, redacted, a father who had lost three children one fateful night to this creature, contacted me with some new information I had not known about it. Apparently, Richard hurt the beast. When his children went missing, and the police had done nothing to truly help him find them, Richard had taken matters into his own hands. He combed the woods with a shotgun, a crossbow and a can of bear mace. After hours of looking for his children for hours, he had found them, piled on top of each other in the previously stated conditions. He stood above them in shock, not knowing what to do, their corpses starting to decay as they've been here for quite some time already, and the bugs have begun to have their way with them. And then the gangly man appeared in the trees. It stood there, both of its hands covering its mouth like it had just told a joker and was stifling a laugh. Richard didn't think, he didn't feel fear as he saw it, he only felt his rage build. He lifted his crossbow and fired, but missed. The bolt whizzed past the creature's head, missing it by mere inches. This made the thing laugh a disturbing and disgusting sound as it ran towards Richard. He then dropped his crossbow and lifted his shotgun, firing directly into the thing's torso. The bullets didn't penetrate. They merely hit its chest and left a red mark upon it, as if the creature was merely smacked. It grabbed the gun from Richard's hands and swung it across his face, knocking him to the ground. It then stood over Richard, towering over him with an evil intent in its all-white eyes. It lowered its head down to Richard's face, unhinging its jaw to consume him, but Richard was ready. He felt for the bear spray that was velcroed to his pants, ripping it from its holding place. He pointed it directly at the creature and he sprayed. The gangly man shot backwards, throwing its hands to its face and screaming a horrendous sound. It teetered and faltered on its feet, yet did not fall. Then, it lowered its hands and looked at Richard who was back on his feet now, shotgun back in hand. Its eyes were blood red now, a dark ring forming around both. Its expression changed to one of pure fear and anger, almost like that of his children. He screamed at the creature, challenged it to come at him again. But instead, it turned and ran away, not looking back at Richard. Richard didn't tell the police the story, only that there was a bear close by, hence his weapons. They believed the story he told them. I wish to say that Richard's story ended there. I found out three weeks after coming into contact with Richard, he was found dead in his home. His house was torn to pieces, like someone had come in with intent to only cause damage. Richard was found in his bed, his stomach torn open and his innards all but missing. I hope that passing along Richard's information may help whoever needs it. May God protect anyone who faces the gangly man. So I don't know how to kill it, but I know how to hurt the fucking thing now. And it has me thinking. Damage the eyes enough, and I may be able to damage the brain. So now I have enough information to make my next move. And as God is my fucking witness, this thing will regret taking my baby girl from me. I finally came face to face with the gangly man. Part 3 It worked. It actually fucking worked. I didn't kill the thing. Although from the events that took place last night, I would sure say it's feeling pretty afraid for its life right about now. Catherine, I hope you're up there somewhere looking down at me, proud of what I'm about to accomplish. 
So, where do I start? In my last post, I had a few helpful comments from people who've told me to try flare guns, lots of them, and gasoline. And after finding that posting about the guy who went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the fucking thing, I sure as hell was ready to try. I stocked up on ammunition and gasoline, so much that at worst case scenario I could burn the fucking woods down with me and that thing in the flames. Best case, I have a good enough aim to take this thing down in one shot. I even bought a tree blind to stake out the spot where it took her from me, and I would wait it out. I would find this thing one last time. I pulled up to the same spot me and the police did that night and got out of the car with two canisters of gasoline strapped to my back with four flare guns holstered to my waist, and the memories started flashing back to me immediately. Looking over the tree line, I could still see the red and blue lighting up the abyssal black of the deep wood. I could smell the rainfall again, I could feel the wrenching fear in my chest that something terrible awaited me in these woods. And I felt the shock and terror when that all came true. But this time, I was ready, and I wasn't scared. I was fucking pissed. I remembered the image of that monster. Its elongated arms and legs, its snake-like neck. Its nearly featureless face albeit those bloodshot white eyes. I remembered its smile, with those massive fangs sticking out of its mouth like something out of a John Carpenter film. The sounds of it tearing into my baby girl. The laughter as it ran away. I used all of this to fuel my anger. After tonight, it would be the creature that would remember me. As I walked through the trees, I looked as far in as I could, scoping through the trees as best as possible for any sight of the thing. I made sure to walk the same path as I originally had, trying to find that spot as fast as I could to set up and wait. And it hadn't taken long either as I walked into the clearing. I saw the broken tree, still stained with the blood of my daughter. I saw the path on the other side that the thing had taken that night as it ran from me, laughing its monstrous sound. It took around 20 minutes to set up the blind and bring up the gas canisters. Being up at this angle seemed like the perfect position. I could see the entire opening from here, and there was just something inside of me telling me that it would show up again tonight. I waited for an hour and heard nothing. Two hours. No sound. Four hours later, the sun was now down, and there was still no sound. Until finally, as the last of the sun's light disappeared and gave way to the black, I heard something. I heard a branch break close by. Then more. I heard the leaves amongst the trees start to rustle, even without a breeze moving through them, as if some unknown force was awakening them. I knew this was the thing, it had to be. And I was right. Slowly, I began to see trees bending away from each other in the distance, making a path coming towards the opening. I then saw it, pushing the trees away to make room for its pathway. It finally entered the clearing and it stood there for what had felt like an eternity, its arms on the ground and its head dropped low like a Neanderthal. I watched it, flare gun in hand, as it walked to the broken tree. It leaned down to the stain and slowly licked at it, its body twitching with every taste. I aimed the gun. It stopped licking. I steadied my breath. It stood and smiled. I waited for my hand to steady. Even in the vein-covered white eyes, I felt it look directly at me. I fired. In an instant, the entire area was covered in the brightest red light imaginable. I couldn't see the creature beyond the light, but I knew my aim was good enough to make contact. I heard it let out this blood-curdling, high-pitched roaring scream, almost like an alarm system for a town about to be bombed. Then I noticed something confusing. The flare hit the tree stump, bounced to the ground and set ablaze on the grass. I wanted to wonder where the creature had gone, but before I had time for that thought to pass, it was in front of me. Somehow, in the time it took me to shoot, the thing dodged the flare and climbed my tree. It was halfway in the blind with me, yet from its size it was face to face with me. Its white and red eyes burning into my memory. It was still smiling, but there was something else to its expression. A rage unlike any I had ever seen before. It let out another scream, but I screamed back at it. Instead of having to reload, I had three other flare guns on my hip, ready to be fired. I grabbed one, aimed directly into its mouth. Before I could pull the trigger, however, I felt its cold, clammy hand wrap around my throat. It grabbed me and threw me to the ground, causing me to roll through the growing flames and knocking the wind out of my lungs. I tried to stand but the shock of the moment caused me to lay motionless as I heard its heavy footsteps approach me. I managed to turn my head and realized it was walking back and forth, pacing the flames. It was trying to decide how to get past them, to get to me. There was an easy gap on both sides of the flame, but the sheer sight of it must have stopped reasonable thought in its head. This gave me enough time to compose myself and to stand back up. I grabbed another gun and tried to aim through the fire, but the creature was watching me, 
and I knew from this distance it would move out of the way like last time. And I couldn't run around the fire because that would give it enough time to prepare an attack on me. So that left me with one option. I lifted the flare gun, unholstered a second and fired them both. Thankfully, they both hit their marks. One went up to the blind, setting the gas canisters ablaze, causing an explosion that lit the treetops above us on fire, the creature ducked down, covering its head at the sound as the area was alive with my hellfire. The second shot went behind the creature, causing another small fire to stir behind it, trapping it in place for me so it only had two options, run through the flames, or stay where I can fucking see it. I grabbed the final flare gun from my side and didn't lift it, not yet. This ends right here, with you and me, I shouted at it as I ran through the flame, jumping up towards its face. It grabbed me by my throat again, but I was prepared for it to try and throw me, so as it lifted me to the sky, I aimed down, now only feet from its face. It couldn't run from something it was holding. I fired the final shot. The flare went right into the creature's left eye, burning a hole through it. Immediately it dropped me to the ground, and covered its face with its hands. I could see smoke billowing through its fingers as it writhed and convulsed in pain and agony. Its screams shook my very core. It turned to run, and since it was unable to see anything at the moment, it ran into the fire behind it. It began to jump and scream more, falling over into the flames and lighting itself on fire. It stood up quickly, a monumentally sized burning man, and yet it ran still into the woods, leaving a path of fire and destruction in its way. I quickly made my way out of the woods. I wanted to chase it down but in my current state, I knew I couldn't continue tonight. So I got back to my car, and I drove away. I didn't even pay attention to the smoke as I found my way back onto the road. I didn't even look at the fire trucks as they sped past me. What I did pay attention to, however, was its screams. Even with the emergency vehicles blaring past me, I could still hear its anguishing cries in the woods. I prayed it would find no escape. I prayed the flames would capture it and take it with them. I awoke the next morning to a nightmare. After I showered and cleaned my wounds, I came to my computer to write up the events of last night. I turned on my television for white noise, but something caught my attention. It was an emergency news bulletin. Eight of the 14 firefighters were killed in the incident, while the other six have been hospitalized from the attack. Nobody knows what truly happened last night in the woods outside of, my town's name, but our sources say that one of the survivors was heard telling police to avoid the woods, that a, and I quote, gangly man is in there. Fuck. The end of the gangly man. Part 4. This will more likely than not be my final post, as I know I have so little time left. I tried to fight it, I tried to kill it, I tried so fucking hard to end it before it got this far but instead I made it so much worse. I thought losing Catherine would be the worst of it, but no, what's about to come is universally worse. I fought the gangly man on its turf, right where I saw it take my daughter from me. I burned the fucking thing to the ground and I saw the fear in its eyes but it continued to get up until the entire forest burned. I thought it would run away and find somewhere to lick its wounds. Man, I was so fucking wrong. Immediately the next morning, I heard on the news that the firefighters dispatched to the forest were either dead or hospitalized, all ranting and raving about it. They all saw it kill their friends, and somehow they lived to tell the story. I think it lets them live, I think it knows I would hear what they had to say one way or another, like it wants me to know it's coming for me. We hadn't heard anything else about the situation for the past two weeks, just that people were warned to stay indoors as much as possible and to keep their doors and windows locked, and keep their pets indoors as well, because the news was spinning the story like a wild bear on the loose. Fuck, if we were only that lucky. Now, in the last week I've seen on Facebook and Twitter that things are getting even more weird. I've seen photos of it lurking around people's houses, video footage, some quite obviously fake, of it messing with window latches and door knobs, like it's learning how they function. And now there were the trucks. Big armored trucks patrolling the streets every night and every day. They're armored to high hell and have what looks like a giant grenade launcher on the top that looks automated, or controlled from the inside of the vehicle. Armored men were stationed at every street corner in fully kitted gear, holding these massive assault rifles, some with street sweeper shotguns. It looked like a scene out of Red Dawn for Christ's sake. I saw one guy from out my bedroom window hollering at them. Asking them what they were doing here. The one with the rifle didn't even look at him, just pointed at his feet and shot, missing by inches. Needless to say the guy took off, and I heard nothing else about people asking questions since. The final sweep started to trend on Twitter for a bit, and until two days ago, I hadn't known what that meant. Until it happened. 
Until the levee broke. Last night, I was laying in bed and just watching conspiracy videos on the gangly man in my town when out of nowhere gunshots broke out just outside my window. Blast the fucking thing. Kill it. Kill it. Kill IT. I jumped up to my window and was face to face with the most hellacious scene I've ever witnessed. The men, now a group of 10 or more, were lined up and firing down the road into the black of night. I tried to see what they were shooting at, and for a moment I couldn't see it, but then it came into view. Barreling down the street, swinging its arms and laughing maniacally was the gangly man. Its arms seemed to bend and break and readjust with the swings and its head rocked back and forth in every direction on its neck like it was broken. The bullets were bouncing off of it like rubber pellets and they weren't even leaving a mark on it. But it was marked now. Its skin was crispier than I remember, looking taut and stretched like new leather. And its eye, where I made contact, was now a black and empty hole of puss and flesh. And yet it still ran at the soldiers like it was unharmed. When it was finally on them, it made short work out of the front line, picking one man up and snapping him in half like a toothpick. Then it picked two more men up at once, shoving them both into its gaping moi, legs first, and crunched down. Their screams, I'll never forget that sound. It stomped on a few others, crushing them beneath the force of its surprisingly strong legs. Then there were two left, and what I witnessed was a fucking shock. One guy pushed his partner down and shot him in both knees, leaving him as bait as he turned and ran toward the closest thing he could think of as a safe place to hide. Toward my fucking house. The gangly man stomped down on the crippled soldier's back, severing his spine with ease, and turning on the body to run towards that last one. I didn't think. I just acted. I ran to my front door, swinging it open and hollered for the soldier to get in. He dived in, clearing past me in the process. I stood in the doorway as the thing ran across my yard towards me. Hey fuckface, I said in such a low confident tone that even surprised me. It slid, nearly tripped on itself, and stopped only inches from me, its face in front of mine. I could smell its breath, the flesh of the soldiers it ate dangling from its teeth. I was hoping it wouldn't look away from me and it didn't. Because there's one tiny thing I hadn't mentioned yet. I was waiting for his moment. What I hadn't said yet, was that I had rigged up a special surprise for it when this moment would come. Without getting into much detail. I had four hoses hooked up to gas canisters that were inside of a dispenser I had built that would cover my yard and diesel at a moment's notice. Also, I had a lighter on me at all points in time. I pulled out a garage door opener I had bought online that was set up to the dispenser and flicked the switch. Immediately the thing and I both smelled the strong scent of gasoline fill the air. I then pulled out my lighter and flicked. In its one good eye, I saw the fear I was hoping for as the flame sparked. I threw it at its feet and in mere seconds it felt like I was back in the forest again. It fell backwards, writhing in pain and screaming into the night with such a grotesque, vile sound, it nearly made me throw up. It tried to stand, but the gas was still being poured on it and causing it to slip and burn more and more. Finally, I saw its skin begin to rip apart like jerky. The screams began to sputter out and the movement began to slow. Minutes later, it was an oversized tusk of a dead monster. I finally did it. I finally fucking killed the thing. It was over. So I thought. I turned to the soldier who was staring out at the thing from the floor in wide eyes astonishment. Wasn't my first encounter. Was all I said. Fuck. 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 He said as he stood up, looking outside. He turned to me, his eyes still wide. What time is it? Like 5.30. Why? Fuck. He fell to his knees. We're out of time. The soldier, Logan Donaldson, began to tell me that he worked for an organization that dealt with these things. They would come in, assess the situation, and deem what was the necessary course of action. Apparently the gangly man wasn't the only of his kind, as Logan told me he's faced many of them before and the only way to truly eradicate them was through an oral injection of a chemical a team of scientists that the organization had come up with that melts its insides. That thing out there, it ain't dead. It'll evolve through the pain and be that much harder for us to kill. He then went on to tell me that in these cases, where an adult life form has planted its home here, they can never be sure if it is young around, so the only course of action was complete erasure of the population. Which means scrubbing the internet for any sign of my hometown and encounters with the gangly man. Which means bombing the town. He said the bomb was going to drop in a half hour, so I should send my goodbyes. I've messaged everyone I knew, friends, family, exes and people I was interested in. I said goodbye. I'm sitting on my front step right now, 
having a cigarette with Logan as we watch the breathing on the thing slowly come back and writing up this final post on my phone. It won't recover fast enough, listen. It was so silent, but in the distance I could hear the plane engine. I love you so much Catherine, I'll see you soon. The Darwin. Name, Darwin. Assessment, Top Level Threat. The Darwin species is a creature of unknown origin, though through various civilizations a tale can be connected to it or its kind. Many tales exaggerate its appearance, but more often than not they will get the most obvious details correct. This leads us to believe that the Darwin species has had varying characteristics through history, possibly to adjust to its environment. This would adhere to its capabilities mentioned in the third paragraph of this document. Locating any and all Darwin and elimination of the species is of top priority for the organization as letting them continue out in the world can cause widespread panic and in most cases, total collapse of towns and even cities it makes its nest within. Organization specialists work non-stop, searching the internet for any plausible evidence of Darwin sightings. Once confirmed, a team will be sent to the location to assess if the Darwin has entered its prime state yet. They will then act accordingly to their assessment. Description the Darwin species is a humanoid creature with inhuman appearances. All seem to be hairless, albeit its ancestors seem to have had a small covering of hair. Most Darwins reach a height of 13 feet tall when entering their prime state, yet most don't make it that far. The only one on record for the organization is the one in, redacted. Darwins have elongated arms, usually stretching to be longer than the length of their legs, causing them to drag on the ground at most times. Although Darwins must consistently eat on a nightly basis, it would seem as though they never grow in weight as the time they enter prime state, they all look to be that of a starving human, with their rib cages nearly exposed and their fingers looking bony and frail. Darwins have an always open maw that looks broken, full of jagged teeth like broken fangs and more than always they will be letting out a horrendous sound, similar to the laugh of a madman. But in fact this is their pained howls as the Darwins are constantly growing. When the sound stops, this is a signal that the creature has reached its prime state. Darwin's eyes are a flat white, usually bulging from their sockets. They have no lids, which when initially observed we believe this to mean they were blind. However, Darwins have proven to see in one way or another, whether it's through extrasensory means or something we don't yet understand. A Darwin's neck is also elongated, roughly two feet in length at most times in its life cycle. Their head sways and swings as they move cracking the bones in their neck until their evolutionary trait deemed the fix takes place. Abilities The Darwin has an inhuman strength, with the ability to lift nearly everything we've tested on it. The heaviest thing we've thrown at a Darwin was a block of obsidian that weighed over 45 tons and it grabbed it with one hand. Along with the strength, Darwins have inhuman speed. When combining their speed and strength, Darwins have the capability to run through buildings without pause. Darwins also have an ability called the fix which is the ability they get their name from. In 99% of our testings, nothing can kill a Darwin. Plenty of things could hurt it, even maim it, but nothing could cause lethal damage to it. Any form of damage caused to the Darwin would leave its mark, quickly heal, and then it wouldn't take damage from the same thing after. One Darwin that we had captured in its infant state was shot in the head point blank with a rifle using anti-tank rounds. The bullet went through the head leaving a clean hole and stopping the creature in its tracks. Within moments of capture, the hole had disappeared and the creature was even more feral than before. The agent who originally shot it was tasked with doing so again. The bullet bounced off of the Darwin and ripped through the agent's sternum, killing him instantly. Anything a Darwin becomes immune to, these traits will pass on to their young. On this topic, a Darwin is asexual, needing no partner to reproduce. When they reach their prime stage, a Darwin will find as many random places through its nesting area, usually within the town it resides near, and lay its eggs. The eggs are laid orally, and it is a grotesque scene to witness as its already gaping maw opens even further to lay its young. It will bury the eggs beneath the ground for several weeks before they hatch and are rampant among the town. The babies are instantly hungry and will feed on anything they can find, not needing humans as sustenance until their third week of growth. Weaknesses As stated above, almost nothing we've tested has had any long-lasting effects on the Darwin except for one surefire way to bring it down for long enough to escape being captured by the creature. It seems to have an aversion to fire. One scientist who was testing our prime state Darwin had lit a cigarette in the room with the creature and had noted that as the match struck, the creature backed up and began to cower in the corner, showing the first signs of true fear to something. Further testing on this proved that not only does fire scare the creature, but it actually hurts it, burning the arm of our prime state Darwin had left blackened marks that had never healed. 
Using heated blades to cut into its skin would leave scars, even though the cut itself would head, the burnt flesh would not. This, we posit, could mean that with enough fire, a Darwin could theoretically be put down. Depending on the assessment of growth in the found Darwin, agents are tasked with Motion 24 CB, or the clean bomb. They will lure the creature into town and do whatever they must to damage it enough to put it down. If this fails, a B-52 bomber will be sent overhead to cleanse the location. Incident Report 1A Date, Redacted Location, Redacted Two agents, Smith and Harrison, were tasked with assessing a Darwin sighting in a small town in the province of Redacted, Canada. Agents put together a strike force to bring with them, each given the information that the creature they were chasing was suspected of being more rampant than their previous encounters. Any and all flame-creating items were removed from the team before departure, and each was told to distract, not hurt. Upon entering the town, the force immediately saw that the creature had run wild. Homes were torn in half, people were riding wherever possible. Coffins were half buried along the back roads for some people. Others still lay where the creature left them. An audiovisual feed was sent to us from the agents at all times. What followed was the last recording they had transmitted. Three of the agents are standing on a street corner, it is late at night, according to the feed's hut it is just past midnight. Smoke can be seen in the backgrounds of each feed. This is believed to be fires created by those who lost their loved ones, as they had nowhere left to bury anyone. Agent Smith, fuck, I wish this thing would just show itself already. Three days in this boot fuck of a town got me sent up the wall. Agent Harrison, tell me about it. Tried to bomb a smoke off of some of the locals and they fucking pelted me with a rock. Agent Smith, laughing, so that's where that shiner came from? Should have shot the fucking moose hump and fucks where they stood and called it a day. Agent Harrison, don't get me started. Took every ounce in me not to start firing. Agent Smith raises his cell phone to Agent Harrison. Agent Smith, man, you gotta read this when I'm done. Some dude was uploading stories from Site 34, you know that town we bombed down and redacted? Apparently he kept a log of his encounters with the Darwin. He called it the Gangly Man, what a fucking name. Guy put up a pretty good fight against the fucking thing. Took it down himself just before we bombed the place. Says he met Logan. Agent Harrison, ya yeah, dude say? Yeah, let me know when you're done, I'd love to hear that guy's story. Too bad we sent him on a one-way trip to the pearly gates. Task Force Member Number 1, Agents, we ain't alone no more. Agent Smith, the fuck you me? Agent Smith's feed cuts out. From the Task Force Member's feed we see an elongated hand protruding through Smith's chest, coming from somewhere behind him in the dark. The task force member changes his camera to night vision and we get our first view of the Darwin. This one is the tallest one we've ever seen to date. It looks to be roughly 20 feet in height, and its arms an equal length. Its face is scarred and darkened, we theorize this to be from the townsfolk who had come across it. The creature is motionless, silent, its hand slithers out of Agent Smith's chest as he falls to the ground. Agent Harrison, soldier, when I say fire, you. Feed shows task force member fleeing the scene before he is lifted into the sky. Harrison's feed shows the Darwin's arm reach out and grab the soldier by his head and lift him up. The sound of the soldier screaming peaks our audio receiver before the sound is stopped with a crushing sound. The soldier falls to the ground in a rain of blood, headless. Agent Harrison remains vigilant, staring down the creature as its face slithers down to his eye level. His feed shows us that the creature is completely eyeless, and its bottom jaw is swaying back and forth, revealing sharp sickly looking teeth agent harrison whispering guys lock onto my position and prepare to drop the hot ones harrison out agent harrison lifts his rifle to the creature and fires the darwin lets out a blood-curdling scream that destroys the microphone in harrison's device the last thing the feed shows is the darwin's face lunging towards the camera smiling nearly from ear to ear the location was bombed only a half hour later call me whistleblower this document was sealed tight by the organization, along with the rest of their knowledge on other creatures out there. I fear they have something else planned, something bigger. I don't know what it is, but there's something about Site 34 that they're not telling us about, either. After the bombing, I saw soldiers carrying in two body bags. One hadn't seemed odd, only that they were bringing it here. The other one though, it was too long. Inhumanly long. Whatever this is, it's something none of us could be prepared for. I will release more files if I'm able to, but even getting this one out to the public is putting me in danger. Please, read it over. If you've seen anything strange that resembles this creature, avoid it. And if you can't, well, 
Hopefully this document will aid your survival. May God have mercy on us all. The Iraq. I need you guys to accustom yourselves to the things I deal with daily. I am, was, I don't know, a senior researcher at this organization for so long, but I can feel the change coming. There's something happening here and I can't quite put my finger on what, but I know there's something about to happen. Something bad. So as previously stated, you can call me whistleblower. I'm going to release as many files as I can to the public until either I get caught, or I find out what's going on. It started with that kid from that town, I can't put his name or the towns because they're always searching the internet for keywords, releasing his encounter with the Darwin, he called it the gangly man. But there's so much more than that creature, and you all need to know about them. Watch out for each other out there. Subject number 2283. Name, Iraq. Assessment, low level threat. Not much is known about Iraq at the moment, as only one has ever been witnessed and captured at this time. If left in the wild, this creature has potential to become a high-level threat, but thanks to organization personnel, we have managed to detain it before any real damage could be done. What the Iraq fails to have in defensive capabilities, it makes up for in offensive abilities, as it was easy to lure into containment, only after losing 10 of our agents in the process. If there are other Iraqs out in the wild, we believe that they do not pose a major threat to populations as we can capture them or destroy them faster than they can cause any form of serious damage. Organization specialists work non-stop, searching the internet for any plausible evidence of Iraq sightings. Once confirmed, a team will be sent to the location to assess if the sighting of the Iraq is real. They will then act accordingly to their assessment. Description The Iraq is a creature whose description will never do it justice. It is the size of a small dog, like a corgi or something of that stature. It contains the body of a spider, but where its face should be, there is a parasitic worm-like creature protruding. Although it has an arachnid body, we have not witnessed this creature to be fast moving. It's as if the spider existed before the parasite, and is now left in a catatonic, zombie-like state. This doesn't explain the size of the creature however. The parasite is translucent, with its organs and veins easily viewed by the observer. From what we have gathered, it has a tube-like orifice inside of it that is its mouth, as we can see it sticking into the area of the spider that it has attached itself to. Sometimes, we can see it sucking something from inside the spider, and other times we can see it pulsing something into it. As the parasite has no eyes and from what I've gathered, no ears either, we've assessed it to be totally blind and deaf, only moving on extrasensory capabilities. Abilities The first thing we discovered about the Iraq is the fact that it does not need to hear or see. The creature uses its spider legs to tap onto the ground with force, and feels the vibrations of things around it in a 10 meter radius. It tends to move slowly, tapping the ground and then taking a minimum amount of steps before tapping again. The Iraq also seems to be able to give off a certain pheromone that lures in prey, which are usually farm animals of any size, from dogs to horses to cows, but sometimes even humans if they approach too close to the creature. When the prey animal has caught the scent of the Iraq's pheromones, they will cease anything they were doing and walk towards it. When close enough to its target, the parasite removes itself from its host's body and will crawl on the ground towards its meal. It will then attach itself to the creature and slowly dig inside of it with its tube-like mouth. Depending on the size of the creature, the parasite could be within it for a 24-hour cycle, until it has consumed its innards. Finally, it will crawl out of the husk and find its way back to the spider's body, which will be tapping consistently throughout the process. Upon finding the Iraq that we have in captivity, agents witnessed it inside of a farmer's wife, slowly making its way out of her stomach to return to its host. Seven agents were close to the creature, watching the process with live footage being streamed back to the organization. When the parasite returned to its host, they didn't move, we realized in this moment that as a defensive measure, the spider body continues to release the pheromone while the parasite eats, and our agents were all trapped by the smell of it. The creature turned and disposed of them all accordingly. A transcription of the even will be attached to the bottom of the file. Weaknesses The Iraq has numerous weaknesses. Gunfire, open flame, physical damage, and starvation all seem to affect the creature. It was a quick recovery speed, healing from a gunshot to one of its legs in four hours, so agents who are to approach one are trained to kill it before getting too close. The, redacted, farm incident. Date, redacted. Location, the, redacted, farm, redacted. Seven agents arrived on the scene after our internet team found postings about a spider-like creature eating the farmer's livestock. 
Upon approach, their live feeds gathered the sight of four dead cows, countless dead chickens and four dead horses. Pigs were roaming freely, eating grass and whatever meat was left on the animals' husks. Upon entering the farmhouse, agents firstly noted the sound of the axe tapping, and approached the area. Agent 1, Jesus fuck, this house smells like an outhouse. Agent 2, honestly an outhouse would smell better than this. Agent 3, stay sharp, I fucking hate spiders. Upon entering the kitchen, the agents all stopped at the sight of the farmer's wife, misredacted, laying on the floor on her back, a pool of blood surrounding her. The spider was on the table, tapping the wood over and over. When we asked the agents to describe what they were seeing for audio transcription, they did not respond. Slowly, the parasite removed itself from misredacted, and made its way to the agents, tearing into them one after the other. A second team was dispatched after proper assessment of the Iraq, they were given full scent protection wearing organization-made gas masks. Upon arrival, the Iraq was making its way down the driveway of the house. One agent stepped out of the vehicle. When close enough, the parasite detached itself from the host once more, but since our agent was unaffected, she was able to grab the host body and place it in our containment case. Two other agents did the same to the parasite, keeping it from its host's body until returned to the lab for inspection. I haven't been able to find any story about the Iraq online, I'm assuming the organization has already scrubbed its existence off of the internet, so releasing this file is really putting my neck out there, but it has to be done. I keep finding these restricted access files on the higher ups computers titled Omega Protocol, and I've been around the sun enough times to know something with that kind of a name isn't good. I took this job because I believed we were good. I believed we were bettering the world and keeping it safe from these monstrosities. Now, I'm afraid. I fear we're going to be the destruction of our people. The Moro Incident I took this job thinking about the money. Fuck, a six-digit paycheck is enough to make anyone dream of the opportunity. How could I say no? With Elizabeth at home, with her medical bills piling up. Of course, looking back at it now, I realized I was offered this position because they knew I fucking couldn't say no, those damn pricks. You don't understand how bad I could just call them out on this right here and right now, but I know I'd have a bullet in my head in minutes if I even dared type their name in this. You've seen whistleblowers postings, you've read the tale of the kid from that town. Well now it's time you hear about me, and my encounter with the truth. All I know is that whistleblowers got some large boys in his pants to be doing what he's doing. Call it inspiration I guess, because seeing him do it made me realize more of us should. Hell if I know if it'll make a difference in the end, but it's worth a shot. Better that we let you know what's coming now before it's already upon us all. My name, I guess I can't give it out. Under the hole if we say too much we're dead thing. Call me Jack Frost. I'm a fresh recruit to the organization, they hired me in January, had me trained and debriefed by the middle of March, and I've been here, at Outpost Sigma 3 ever since. I've been tasked with security detail in this underground facility in Alaska, which in itself is a pain in the ass. Add a clusterfuck of abnormals, what we call the creatures the organization deals with, and some crazier than Dr. Frankenstein lab rats and you get the picture of what my day-to-day -day life is like. For the most part, my job is peachy. A whole lot of standing around with the other guards, toting our rifles and shock sticks around, pushing around the nerds. It's high school all over again, except I'm on the frat boy side now. My main job is to ensure no outbreaks happen. Usually I follow the scientists into their testing areas and stand there or watching them poke and prod these fucking things like they're emotionless husks. And I can tell you with certainty, some of them seriously have my sympathy with what these fucks do to them. Like mother, she's a low-level threat, but I won't get into her right now. Maybe Whistleblower can dig up her file for you at some point. The whole reason I felt the need to come clean was what transpired about two weeks ago when our acquisition team brought in a subject that to me looked, different, than the rest. It was a kid. A little girl, maybe 12 years old. She had this deep red hair that was long and it covered her face at first so I didn't initially see that she was blind. They're pulling her in by the neck with this pole and choker device, her hands chained behind her and her feet also chained together, poking her with a cattle prod like she's some fucking fearsome thing. One of the lead researchers met them at decontamination to ask them questions about her, like where they found her and what she was doing. They were very hush-hush about the whole thing, and I didn't make out much aside from one of the captors saying she was brought here for something called the Moro test. I thought nothing of it. At first, days went by and there was no sign of the girl, no talk about her. Usually I can pick up from the lab rats talking about what's up with a new abnormal, 
but none of them were speaking about her. Finally, curiosity got the better of me so I decided to start snooping around. For six days, I found nothing. No sign of her, and actually no sign of the scientist who took her away. I scoured the entire facility and found nothing. I looked in the top levels, and there was nothing new there, just our Darwin, our Wraith and Slither, and a few others. I checked the low levels. Nothing. I looked around in the to be assessed section, nothing. And then I found her. Just when I was ready to give up on this whole thing, I found a room I usually passed. It was one on the second floor of the facility labeled Moro Lab. I avoided this room as much as I could because the last time someone went in there when they weren't permitted, well, they ceased to exist, legally speaking. Something was in my head on this day, however, and I just couldn't shake the feeling that I had to see what was on the other side. After seeing Whistleblower show the world some of the truths, it made me begin to wonder. If we're tasked with keeping secrets from the world, what secrets are being kept from us? I entered the room and was met with blackness for a moment, before the automatic lights flashed on. In front of me was a large switchboard, full of buttons and levers and keyboards. It looked like something out of a sci-fi flick, then again, basically everything here does I guess. The room was cut in half by a large glass panel, the other side was still black. I could hear something, however, coming from the other side. Some sort of movement. I walked up to the switchboard and looked it over, trying to find a way to turn the lights on on the other side. I noticed a screen on the switchboard flashing awaiting input, so I tried typing in the word lights and just like that, what was on the other side was illuminated, and as my eyes looked upon it, my blood ran cold and my mind went quiet. On the other side of the glass was a chamber, its walls were made of metal bars, each lined with barbed wire and electrical wire wrapped around that. Inside of the cage were three things. Firstly, there was the scientist, dead. He was broken in half. Still connected, but his spine was snapped in two and he lay on the ground with his head touching the back of his feet. His eyes stared out in my direction, but I could tell he was more than dead. Beside him was a pile of skin and bone, topped with red hair. And beside that, was this fucking thing I could not explain even now that I think back on it. A pile of flesh, moving, breathing. It was leaking so many forms of liquid, I felt like I could smell it from this side of the glass. I could see parts that resembled arms and legs, but broken down and in some ways just not exactly what they were supposed to be. It was as if someone had ripped the girl's innards out and blended them together. I don't know how long I just stood there and stared at the thing before I finally managed to take my eyes off it and looked down, noticing a clipboard on the floor. I picked it up and what I read was the nail in the coffin for why I had decided to start spilling this place's fucking secrets. Read the file. Understand that this thing, this, Moro, was the beginning. They're about to open the fucking hell gates on us all. Start preparing for the end, everyone. The Moro test is a series of biological, neurological and chemical tests administered to a subject in hopes of creating the ultimate being. Through our research on abnormals, especially that of the Darwin species, our team at Site Sigma 3 of the, redacted, organization hope to achieve what the majority of humanity already believes, us, on the top of the food chain. For too long have these creatures been wiping out large-scale numbers of populations across the globe for us to sit back and allow this to continue. We hope to bring on a better world through forced evolution. Subject name, Louise Vokshek. Age, 13. Weight, 120 pounds. Height, 4 feet, 2 inches. Family, only father, removed upon acquisition. Notes. It would seem after numerous attempts to see any significant change, Louise was another failed candidate, or so I would have believed until today. Upon entering the lab room, I noticed the girl on the ground, holding her stomach. At first, I believed that she was going to pass away like the others, but then the metamorphosis began. Her body began to convulse and an acrid smell permeated from her cell. Although it was noted that she was blind, color appeared in Louise's eyes again and she looked directly at me even in her state. Her bones began to bend and break in her arms, the bone snapping out of the elbow and continuing to do so until the entire arm bone was removed from the flesh. The same would happen to the rest of her skeletal system until the girl was now a pile of flesh and bone, leaving behind her skin. The mound began to move rhythmically, as if it were breathing. I believe this to be so. It then began to reform itself, but it would seem that it didn't know how to do so. At first, it seemed to look human as it formed two legs, a torso, and two arms. When it got to the head, however, things turned around. It was close, I could see the formation of the brain, then of eyes, a mouth, 
But quickly everything collapsed inward on itself, leaving a grotesque form of flesh on its shoulders. Following this, for whatever reason, the same would occur to the arms as they melted inward to the torso and meshed together with the pile of the head as it disassembled itself. A sound could be heard from it, like a pain scream that was covered beneath the sound of bones cracking and flesh tearing. For a moment, I believed it was dead, but then I saw the movement. It began to breathe. It began to eat itself and create new, always failing to form anything substantial, but nevertheless living. The same essential process then occurred with the legs, and this new creature was born. I know not its capabilities yet, nor do I know how sustainable it is. Further testing is required. I will enter the cage and see if it is able to function in a moment. This is our first successful creation, and if it can do what we have been hoping for, then we can move on to phase 2. For the sake of our future, I pray this is it. I need to say this. I entered the room, I had to see what the creature was capable of, how it had killed the scientist. As I approached the cage, I began to realize that the lab rat seemed, empty. Then I realized he was. This pile of fuck must have taken out his innards for itself. How, I don't know, but it surely was disgusting to look at even more up close. I could see the eyes, swirling around in the mass, looking everywhere. Hands would begin to form and reach out in all directions, only to melt back into itself. A mouth appeared for a moment, and it let out a low humming sound before it too disappeared. I stood there, staring at it. And then one of the eyes looked at me. At that moment, the creature moved at such a speed I didn't even manage to comprehend what was happening. It entered the scientist, melting itself down to fit into every orifice of his body. The husk shook and writhed as its body was filled with this thing. Then, like a marionette puppet, he stood up, his body shaking still. It looked down on me. Consume, it said, I will consume. If this is the beginning, what in the Holy Lord's name is phase 2? Posted by you slash unseen visitor. The Journal of Ezekiel Harrison Hayden. March 24, 1812. My name is Ezekiel Harrison Hayden, and I have recently been diagnosed with a sickness I fear will take me far before death will. In the words of my doctor, my brain is deteriorating, and I am now losing my own memory and sense of self. It had been recommended to me to keep to a journal, to ease my pain and have a physical reminder of thoughts I may lose. To be restrained to writing my life on paper, surely I have already lost myself. I have been told by my doctor this will ease my descent, that I won't just lose all sense of self in one fell swoop. Yet, I know not what would be a worse fate, to go at once or slowly fall from grace. But to rely on a simple journal to keep myself, myself, someone such as I could never keep to such silly activities. Such innate and downright absurd living is for those weaker than I. In truth, I fully believe that even my doctor does not know what he is speaking of. I'm 36 years of age, and to lose one's memory? So early? Simply impossible. My job at the law firm won't keep me on anymore. Firing me on the lousy grounds of me being a liability. They think that this diagnosis means that I cannot hold my own in the court of law. Just simply wrong. I have such a high success rate with my clients. And yet, dear diary, here I sit, bottle of liquor in my hand and half of its contents already within me, with no employer to speak of and no future goals aside from watching my own decline. So now, dear book of my memories, it is just you and I and my bottles of scotch. Until I forget that even you exist. I assume. March 30, 1812. I know not if it's these walls I've been confined to, or the copious amounts of pills and alcohol swimming through my body, but I swear I've started hallucinating. Just last night as I lay in bed, listening to the dock workers unloading whatever shipments had come in through the day, I heard the floorboards outside of my bedroom creak, in such a way that I could not help but believe it to be someone walking outside of my door, towards my bedroom. I arose to check out my suspicions, and of course, upon checking the hallway to my kitchen, I found nothing that could have been the culprit. And yet, the feeling did not fade. I entered my kitchen and poured myself another drink, and sat at my table for a moment. Staring out the window, I watched the dock workers, hard at work underneath the lamplight. I imagined their journeys at sea, what curiosities they may find on the waters, what adventure it must be to go to distant lands. I myself could never be found on a ship for simply the thought makes my stomach tighten and my throat dry. And yet, I cannot help but find myself fascinated by that which terrorizes me so. Through my thoughts, however, the lingering feeling that another soul was within my home. I could not shake the feeling that I was being watched. Like someone was just out of my sight. Watching. I had never once thought that losing myself would cause so much distress mentally. 
My name is. My name is Ezekiel Harrison Hayden. April 18, 1812. Earlier today, upon coming home from picking up my necessary medication and alcohol, dear diary I swore I saw someone in my kitchen window. They were looking right at me. I rushed in to confront my intruder but yet again, was at a loss at finding anyone within any room. As I sat down to pour myself a drink, I realized that the bottle the alcohol was being poured from had not matched the empty bottles on my counter. They were all aged scotch and this was a cheap whiskey. I swear to you, as the breath leaves my lungs, that I had acquired the same bottle as I always had. Alas, I will not dwell. As long as this does the trick of numbing my current state, I more than certainly will find no trouble in drinking it either way. My name is Ezekiel Hayden. April 23, 1812. I had locked myself out today, or so I had believed. In a drunken stupor, I walked to the nearest bar as I had no more alcohol in the house and in honesty, I couldn't remember where the liquor store was today. After a few hours of drinking and conversing with the local patrons, I returned home but couldn't get my key to work the door, so I broke the glass to get in. I was nearly immediately greeted by a man holding a rifle, hollering at me, questioning why I was breaking into his home and telling me he would kill me if I didn't leave. I was ready to attack this man, lying to me in my own home. How dare he, tell me that this place in which I have lived for countless years not be my own home. And then, as if out of nowhere, the realization hit like a train. This indeed was not my home. These walls were not mine. None of this place was even remotely familiar to me. Needless to say, I came to my senses awfully quick and realized that he in fact was correct. Thankfully the man was kind enough to allow my apologies and had sent me on my way. Returning home, however, I found that my key had no use in the door as it was ajar. Entering my kitchen, I heard footsteps in the hallway again. I called out, asking who was in my house and instead of receiving an answer, I had a blood-curdling scare. The footsteps, they grew in speed and ferocity, coming to my location. I fell to the ground and covered my head with my hands, waiting for the assailant to be on me, but the moment had not come. The running stopped, or ATL East disappeared. I waited until the sunrise to leave the kitchen and write this down. I'm learning that in these moments of extreme, I feel like I'm my complete self again. My name is Ezekiel, and I will prevail. June 5, 1812. I awoke today covered in blood. My hands and chest were smeared with a dry crimson and, dear diary, I can not even slightly recall why or how it had got there. I racked my brain for hours and could remember nothing. I remember sitting at the bar last night, talking to Clarice, a woman I had grown fond of over the past month, speaking of my illness and how she had lost her brother to the same thing only months prior. She was a writer for the local newspaper, I knew her name had been familiar to me and upon the realization, we began speaking about her job, when she realized she was meant to write, what inspired her. I dared to ask her to dinner a number of times, but I feared making her lose another person to this disease, so I chose to resist my own urges. And now that I stare at myself, covered in a crimson of unknown source, I feel glad I had never allowed Clarice to get too close to me. After stepping out of the bath, I was even more shocked to see that although it seemed it had washed off of me, looking in the mirror revealed that no, it had just spread even more. My name is, oh my god. According to these pages, my name is Ezekiel Hayden. What am I becoming? August 1st, 1812? Where am I? Where in the unholy ghost have I been relocated to? On what other worldly plane has my body been brought to? For I know that this is not the disease speaking, but the place I find myself in now is not on earth. I awoke and found myself in a small, four stone walled room, reminiscent of a jail cell. There was a doorway leading out of the room but upon investigation I learned that it is pitch black beyond this room. Speaking of which, the only light within this room comes from a hole in the wall, close to the size of my torso. Looking through this hole is what confirmed my initial writing today. It seemed, from what I could observe, was that I was in a pillar-shaped tower of sorts, possibly a jail even, outlooking what I believe was an ocean. Looking down, I could see nothing except a vast and unending abyss that contained only the sound of waves. I could not see the waves, as looking down was nothing but black and fog, but I could hear the crashing against the building. To determine the depth would allow me the privilege of knowing more about this place, but that information seemed all but impossible to determine. Looking up was a pitch black sky, nothing to be seen for as far as my vision could reach. From my angle, I could not determine either the top of this building, or even if there were more to it than just this section in which I had found myself. I wished to find out more to learn of anything more about this place. I feel so awake now. I feel like I have a purpose, 
if only for this moment in time, to find an answer to the mountain of questions I now have. The question that seemed to be in the forefront of my thoughts, however, was a simple one, yet one that filled me with a foreboding and ominous dread, which I could not figure why. Where were the stars? I plan to step into the dark hallway and investigate. Maybe I can find another soul here who may have some answers to this dilemma, for I know I cannot be the only one here. I surely cannot be the only living being within these walls. Writing that had given me so much more fear than I had planned. Date unknown. I could not find anyone in the hallways, nor could I find a source of light. I stayed along the wall, looking for even another doorway, but I found nothing of import, only more blackness that consumed me the longer I stayed in it. My sanity slipped the longer I remained, so I began to make a mental map of my travel. I have no way of tracking extended periods of time, but I swear a journal, I swear I was out there in the nothingness for two days at least. This hellish plane of existence, I know not how my arrival came to pass. The only thing keeping me here, in body and in mind, is the belief that I will find an escape. I must find an escape. The waves sound louder than usual now that I've returned to my room, and I think I could finally see a star in the sky. It, it seems dimmer than what stars should be. The color in it seems unlike any I have ever seen. Where would I begin to describe it? It looked as if it were a culmination of every color, yet void of any. Staring into it gave me such peace, yet so much panic as well. I could not even begin to ascertain how long I found myself mesmerized by its appearance. I know not what these changes mean, but I feel some odd fear over these small yet powerful developments. Timeless Entry Number 2 It's out there. In the darkness. And it's coming closer by the second. I heard it as I awoke. Something was outside of my door, when I looked into the blackness, I swear to you that something was standing just outside of my vision. I felt like prey, as my predator stood above me, yet I had nowhere to run or hide. I could feel its breath on my face as I stood frozen in place and in that moment. My very bones froze cold, my skin felt such heat that it surely would melt off the meat beneath. I accepted it as the thing that would kill me in that moment, almost as if it were destined to be that which will take my life, to my very core. Every fear I had ever felt, every moment of pain and anguish that's ever affected me felt as though they were culminating here in this moment, like the blood from that day, circling the drain. Something inside of me told me it knew this as well. It could feel my very soul, its cold claws scraping at my existence and making me feel such madness that my previous diagnosis was not enough. It wanted me to lose hope, to know that my life was in its hands, that it and it alone was allowing me to live. I was a rat in a maze. A prisoner in a jailer's sick and twisted game of hide and seek. I found my strength to back away suddenly, or it let go of me to continue its journey through the abyss. Something inside of me, the only thing I had in this moment, told me to look outside again. Not a voice, but some resonance that passed the words through me like a subconscious thought but with much more sentience. Upon peering out of the hole, I saw yet another factor that sent a ghostly chill up through my body. More stars surrounded the original, all of them matching color and intensity. They seemed to make a pattern now, 15 of them in total, somehow, even with such a low number to count, I could not for the life of me make the pattern make sense to me. I would look to one, and it would seem as though the others were moving, both multiplying and disappearing all in a single moment. I sound insane. Reading these words are making me believe that the doctor was correct. Yet, this seems too, real. These could be the ramblings of a madman, the good lord knows that is probably the case, but I just cannot seem to shake the feeling that this is more than the deterioration of one's mind. I hope for the sake of every other human that is to live on any plane of existence that this is a falsehood, simply the machinations of someone who has finally gone mad. Yet, what if? I could see the water now. It was black from my believe immensity and enormity. And it was getting closer to my level. The speed at which it was rising in the rate, I know not when or if it will overtake me. There are floors above me, I know not how many, or how to reach them but I feared that soon I may have to find out. Something was written on this page but it was so illegible that it looks like scribbles. My final entry. Dear journal, I awoke today to the water in my room now. It's up to my calves already, and I presume it will take this floor too soon. I plan to venture into the dark and either find a new floor, or to drown in the rising tides, or even to be taken by whatever entity has been stalking me for this indiscriminate amount of time. At least I get to decide how I depart the mortal plane with my own sound mind to make these final decisions. My name is Ezekiel Harrison Hayden, and I hope someday that someone reads these words and takes them for more than the ramblings of a madman. I will take this journal with me, so that, 
On January 26, 2021, the journal containing these pages was found by a group of cataphiles exploring a cave close to Jamapikal, Hell Cave, in Slovenia. Aside from being dirty and a bit of aging on the papers, the book seemed to be in near-perfect condition. Upon investigation into the original author's writings, we were able to find a couple of odd discrepancies. The only thing we could find about an Ezekiel Hayden was one in 1812 that police were looking for as a prime suspect in the murder of one Clarice Joanna Thomason. According to the police reports, Clarice was found in her bedroom, her head removed and her body drained of all blood. Odd shapes had been drawn on her walls and in the living room, there was a note, the words in an indeterminate language. After showing the note to numerous linguistic specialists, three came back with the same findings. The letters all matched that of other findings throughout history, dating back to even before that of Ezekiel Hayden. One note with matching writings had been found within the wreck of an English supply ship, another was found within an abandoned hospital, coincidentally within the same town of the Hayden incident. Each piece of paper, containing the same damage and aging, contained the same words. After being deciphered, it was quickly agreed upon that each sheet said these words. For soon, we will awaken him.